Like a lot of people, I enjoy this one particular show on Netflix called Stranger Things. It's kind of like a sci-fi like show, but in it, these kids, they're, they're battling like this force of darkness that resides in this like parallel world to theirs that's called the Upside Down. And the, the creatures from the Upside Down are trying to get into their world. Now the Upside Down, it's, it's like our world, but it's dark and shadowy and scary. And it's, it's not some place that you want to be. You know, with everything going on in our world now and the way that our, our routines are just kind of gone and so much of what life is has is, is changed and is different, there are times I kind of feel like we're in a much, much more pleasant version of the upside down from Stranger Things. I mean, things are just weird. Like, when did going to the grocery store become stressful? Like, at least for me, it was never really that stressful. And now, every time I get home, I got to, like, wipe everything down. And I have to be aware of, of touching things and not touching things and steering clear and social distance. And, and it's all just very strange. And, and I'm already so tired of it. I am so I'm so tired of it, and we're just beginning. And there are times that I know we're so fortunate, right? We are. To be able to shelter in place in our home, to have so much, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much better than it could be. And yet, even still, this was a change I didn't want. This was a change that was unexpected. And this was a change that, that is absolutely unwelcome in every way, which is why I'm so grateful that we've been studying the Gospel of Matthew because that is exactly who Matthew's original audience was, was and what they were going through. They were Jewish Christians living in Antioch, in greater Antioch, that's in modern-day Turkey. They were, uh, a lot of them were folks who had fled from Jerusalem after the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. Now, when Rome had destroyed the temple, they weren't just destroying the temple. They were trying to stamp out Judaism to just get rid of it all together. And so they killed a ton of Sadducees and chief priests and elders and everybody who was influential. And so many people fled. And they were faced with living in what kind of felt like to them the upside down. The, the, the unwelcome, unwanted change. And, and Matthew's writing to be able to say, this is how you can be faithful to God in the midst of undesired and unwelcome change. And that that unwelcome change, it's kind of like a mountain that's before you. And you can't really go around it. You just you have to confront it. And we can't get away from the upside down, topsy-turvy world that we're living in now. Like this is just what life is. And I think today's gospel reading is really an excellent passage to illustrate the upside down, topsy-turviness that is the kingdom of God. Uh, today's passage isn't focused on Palm Sunday. We've been going through the Gospel of Matthew, and so we're actually right before the crucifixion in a passage that uh, we often don't hear about that much because it's not part of the lectionary and it's hard to, to fit everything in when so much has to happen in such a short period of time, you know, going from Palm Sunday to uh, the crucifixion on Good Friday to Easter on Sunday. And so it's really exciting to be able to come and to look at this passage. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 27. It's verses 11 through 31. And as we come to God's word now, let us come again to God in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this word. We thank you for the way that you are able to use it to minister to us. And so God, we pray that as we are dealing with this upside down, topsy turviness of life, that you would be present in that, that you would help us to see you more, to learn more from you, to grow, God, from this time. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for your presence and your spirit here with us now, whenever it is that we are watching this and worshiping together in this way. And so, Lord, I pray that at this time that these words will be yours. If anything I say is not from you, let that fall away. But God, let everything that is from you be planted in the good soil of our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So beginning at verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. 
Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge. So the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man. For today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who was called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, or rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are a few things that really stand out to me in this passage. The first is that while he is on trial before the governor, before Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate asks him, so are you the king of the Jews? You're like, and Jesus said to him, you say so. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't say no, but he just says, you say so. Like, that's clearly why I'm here. But when the chief priests and elders questioned him, Jesus said nothing. And it says that Pilate was greatly amazed by this. Now, I think a better way to put it was baffled. Pilate is baffled. Like, dude, you're on trial for your life here, and you're not going to say anything in your defense? You just, you're just quiet? Now, this fulfilled the prophecy from Isaiah that, that the Messiah would go off like a lamb to the slaughter without a word. Like, this is a fulfillment of prophecy. But even still, Pilate, amazed by this. And then Pilate, as was his custom, was going to release a prisoner. And so he sees the opportunity to set some Jesus free. Because he knows, as the text says, that he was really brought in because of, of jealousy. And so he says to the people, who do you want to go free? Jesus, who was called the Messiah, the Christ, or Jesus Barabbas? The name Jesus means salvation. And it was a common name then. I mean, it's Yeshua, Joshua, Josh, common name now as it was then. And so like Yeshua, Jesus, as we say it, Barabbas. Barabbas means son of the Father. And so he says, who do you want? And the people call out to have released to them the brigand Jesus Barabbas, the one who is an insurrectionist, the one who is violent, and other texts say a murderer. That's the one they call for. And why? Because that's the one, that's the one that looked more like the Messiah that they wanted. Not the suffering servant, but the one who would fight back, the one who, if necessary, would even kill and then we see Pilate, 
who decides he wants nothing to do with this. Now, don't feel too bad for Pontius Pilate, by the way. Uh, history tells us he was, he was not a great guy. He's not this kind-hearted soul. Josephus, the ancient historian, lists all kinds of terrible things that Pilate did and how he was in such trouble with Rome because even Rome was like, buddy, you have gone too far, which I'm just telling you, that says something. And so Pilate, he's just trying to keep the peace, though. And so he says, like, who do you want? They say Barabbas. And so he brings out this, this basin of water and symbolically, like, washes his hands, like, I'm done. Like, I have nothing to do with this. But let me tell you something. No, no amount of, of washing, even if you go more than 20 seconds, is ever going to actually let you, Pontius Pilate, be, be released of the guilt of sentencing a wrong man to death. Or the wrong man, I should say, to death. And so that was this strange thing. Here's this judge. He's supposed to do right, and he doesn't. And then lastly, the soldiers. The soldiers who stripped Jesus naked, who beat him, who put on a scarlet robe, and who then aren't content just to beat his body, but want to beat his spirit and humiliate him as well. And so they mock him and spat upon him. The thing that all of these have in common is that they're actually all the opposite of what you would expect. They're all the opposite of what you would think would happen in a normal situation. In a normal situation, a man who's effectively you know, on trial for his life, he'll say something. He'll defend himself, but that doesn't happen. In a normal situation, if a crowd is giving a chance to choose between letting a righteous, innocent man go free or a criminal, they're not going to choose the murderer. Why would you want a murderer out in your midst? You choose the innocent man, but that's not what happened. Instead, they called out saying that they wanted Jesus Barabbas. And the funny thing is, look at that. They were calling out for the right thing, salvation by the Son of the Father. They chose to have salvation by the Son of the Father. They just chose it in the wrong one. They chose it in the one that they thought salvation would look like. But it's salvation didn't look like a mighty, triumphant person. But it looked like the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. And so that's opposite of what you would expect. And then Pilate, he's a judge. You would think that a judge would be willing to make the hard decisions to do what is right. That's the expectation. That is what would be normal. But Pilate doesn't. And everything is flipped upside down. And then lastly, the Roman soldiers. You know, I mean, like, I know we tend to think of Roman soldiers as terrible guys, bad people, because of situations like this and stories like this. But if you go back to ancient text, like, the so Roman soldiers were thought of as, like, the best of Rome. Just like a lot of times we tend to think the soldiers in our country, they're, they're the best of us. We want them to represent us well. And so they weren't really known in general for a special cruelty or intolerance or whatever else. They would be shocked. So many Romans would be shocked if they thought that, that, that their soldiers, that they expect to be brave and noble, that, that a whole cohort of them, a whole huge group of them, were taking turns mocking and beating a defenseless, severely outnumbered and overpowered man. And yet that's what happened here. And so the whole passage, it's about the upside down. The things that, that you would expect to happen are not what's happening. But that fits Matthew. That fits Matthew for the whole entirety of his gospel. Because look at this now. The chief priest and the elders, they represent the status quo. They represent the traditional ruling structure and what it had always been. And they are fighting Jesus because they're trying to hold on to that status quo. They don't want upheaval. They don't want a reinterpretation of the law. They want to be able to keep things exactly in order and in place and the way they like it. But that's not what the gospel is or what the gospel does. The gospel, the good news about Jesus, 
isn't that everything gets to stay the same and we get to just be comfortable loving you know, our routines and our idols of comfort that we lean on instead of leaning on God, the gospel comes to set us free from so, from so many of these things. And, and so it's often in the upside down that God is most present. Or since God is always here, maybe we should say that we are most aware of God's presence and God's work. Let's take another look at an area of this passage that I hadn't spoken of yet. Thinking about how everything in it's the opposite. This one particular passage of Matthew has fueled more anti-Semitism than any other part of Matthew. And it's where the Jews in the crowd say that they will be culpable for Jesus' blood. His blood be on us and our children. And throughout so much of church history... Christians and even church leaders have looked at this as justifiable anti-Semitism. Don't you see the Jews? They killed Jesus. And even they knew it. And even they accepted responsibility for it in perpetuity. But why would this one thing that seems like a curse being called down upon someone, why would that be the one thing in this passage that was exactly how it seems on face value and not a flipped expectation. Also, we need to see how prevalent the idea of blood is in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew begins with a genealogy, the ancestor list, which he calls a bloodline. Then there's Herod and the slaughter of the innocents trying to kill a young Jesus. You know, so he has all the children under two killed, and they talk about the blood from that. Then Jesus in the Last Supper talks about this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. So we see the blood there and the power of Jesus' blood. Contrasted with the blood money that Judas gives back and how the, the people used, the priests used that money to buy a field because they couldn't go back into the treasury because it was blood money. See the blood happening. And then the Matthew, the only gospel that identifies the robe that the soldiers dressed Jesus up in to mock him as being scarlet, not red, scarlet, the color of blood. Pilate washes blood off his hands. So the blood of Jesus is not on him, on this wicked man. Who is the blood on the blood is on those Jews there. But rather than that mean guilt, what if in flipped expectation, what if in the upside down that is the gospel, the blood means forgiveness, atonement, grace. Because remember, Matthew's writing to Jewish Christians. They've been Jews, now they're followers of Jesus. For all we know, some of them may have been among that crowd or their parents or fathers may have been among that crowd. We, we don't know. But to Matthew's original audience, he might, they would have seen this and they probably wouldn't have seen this as guilt from my people forever. But what they would have seen is, wow, look at how amazing God is right at the time that we're already thinking about Passover. We have the memory of Joseph. And that whole story of Joseph saying to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. That's what God does. That's how God flips things around. So that our expectations are not how he operates. But God works in the upside down. I mean, look at Jesus again with the soldiers. What happens he is actually living out an embodiment of the Sermon on the Mount, that, that pinnacle of teaching, one of the most important parts of the Gospel of Matthew. They beat him. And even though he is powerful enough that he could call on angels to come and rescue him and defend him, he turns the other cheek. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, if someone's suing you to take your cloak, give them the inner garment as well, effectively leaving you like naked to shame them. And Jesus so all his garments removed and it's naked. He says, if someone forces you to go a mile, go the extra mile, the second mile. And what happens in a little bit, in the reading we'll hear on Friday in our Good Friday service, 
what happens? That someone is compelled to carry that cross. And then Jesus said, do not hide your light, but let it shine. A city on a hill's light cannot be hidden. And what happens from here? After this, he is led off to Golgotha, to the hill, to Calvary, where the light shines for all to see, but only to see in the flipped expectations of the upside down. See, everybody else's eyes saw a man being crucified, saw Jesus being defeated, but it was actually the light breaking forth from the darkness and the kingdom of God spreading in this world. Right now, in our world, there is so much that feels like we are living in a topsy-turvy, upside-down kind of world. Yesterday, yesterday I used Clorox wipes to wipe down a bottle of Lysol spray. Hear that again. I used Clorox wipes to wipe down a bottle of Lysol spray because my hands still could have the coronavirus, for all we know, on it when I was spraying down surfaces. Do you not see the, the lunacy of that, the ridiculousness of that? And yet it was necessary, it was necessary to try to protect my household. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. And, and I'm, once again, I am, I am done with this feeling of the upside down. I want to go back to being able to go have my, my routines of comfort and co that allow me to, even if it's wrong, go back into complacency and the comfortable. But, but in the topsy-turvy upside down, do you know what we have to do? We have to actually lean on God for our comfort instead of falling back into routine. See, we can't fall back on the status quo represented by the chief priests and elders. That's not what the gospel came to do. The gospel came to turn everything on its head because in the economy of God's salvation, how does it work? Paul says, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. It's when I'm weak that I'm strong because God's strength is perfected in human weakness. We serve a king who, when he came, didn't consider his divinity something to be exploited, but instead made himself into a slave. A king who served like a slave. A king who taught us that greatness in the kingdom of God is to be a servant as well. A king who took on the job of the lowest slave when he showed his disciples what love is by washing their feet. And he taught us, us that if you want to be first, you have to be last. And that the greatest among you would be like the child. That if you want to be exalted, you must humble yourself. Do you not see everything is the upside down? And so while we are now living in this, this upside down and there are all these challenges, we are actually in an amazing, unique place to be able to, to grow spiritually in ways that we may not have ever had the opportunity before. We are entering Holy Week. And normally during Holy Week, it's like we're trying to vicariously live through the disciples as they are journeying through this time. And they are with Jesus. And we're trying to, you know, we prepare ourselves for, for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. But now... We're actually in the upside down. Our lives feel that way. We feel like everything has been turned upside down. Like we can't fall back on the old idols and the old comforts of just going to a movie or a concert or being with friends or being able to worship in church here. All of that gone. And so how do we make ourselves feel better? How do we bring comfort? How do we assuage fear? We have nowhere to go but to God. And this is maybe why God is perhaps most obviously present to us in the midst of living in the upside down because we can't fall back on those idols and we have to instead go forward leaning on God. And so let me say to you, do not in this holy week do not squander this opportunity that we have. 
for profound spiritual growth. Do not bemoan this time, but instead long for Jesus to come again. Pray for how God can use this time and grow you up in Him. And be aware of God's goodness and God's grace. You see, the power of the gospel is the upside down. That death does not have the final word. That life is found not by clinging tightly to it, but by letting it go and being willing to die. That fear is defeated not by, not by our strategies for fear, but by embracing the fear and trusting God with it. That blood would represent not death, but life. And the time is coming where Jesus will be the perfect offering for all people, the Lamb of God, whose blood does bring us life. We are living in a time of the upside down. Let us use it to experience the kingdom of God afresh and anew. Amen.